Continuing now with the Titanic dialogues, testing out the quality of the normal level of recording. Pulling back on the altar. Giving now a brief overview of the Space Gods. Who are they? What are they? What are my particular theories on them as opposed to others? How do I differ? I won't conquer all these questions now, but I do want to give a overview, say briefly, of my own views regarding them. <clears throat> and to do that, I will, of course, be focusing in on my mystery books, the mystery altar. It's fitting to have the Dogon as my beginning here, because... The Dogon people and their mysterious rituals and contents are, in a way, our best, some of our best evidence for contact with alien intelligences at some level that gives us reason to suspect a bigger picture of general contact in the ancient past. Because how do the Dogon know? precise things about Sirius, and why Sirius? Why does Sirius pop up in all these places, not just the Dogon, but as I have recorded in my mystery book and elsewhere, they appear in many contexts, not all of them good, like the Templar deception of the Solar Temple, where it's a wacky reincarnation scheme, where the aliens from Sirius who have created humanity have also left behind a elite, as it always is, of selected few who are going to get to reincarnate on the planet Sirius if they burn to death in a fire after giving all their money to the cult leader. And, uh, <laughs> you know, on and on. But they represent a flawed, I believe, interpretation of the space god contact mythos. However, the power of the Sirius synchronicity cannot be underestimated. And the Sirius connection is at the core of so many space god-themed mythological plots and has a commonality of evidence beyond any question, in my opinion. And, of course, I've incorporated the serious contents in my own mythos. When I say my mythos, the general picture I paint now based on everything I learned. That's what my mythos is. But this picture includes Sirius, of course, and it has a big Egypt-Cleopatra-Isis connection. And Sirius is the star of Masonic lore, when they have the blazing star in the Masonic lodges, supposedly it's the star Sirius. And here we see my secondary mystery book. This one actually bridges my life in America and my life in Australia, whereas this mystery book is about my life in Australia. My Mastery of Life Rosicrucian Temple book. And in here, we have my primary mythos material regarding the space gods, which is, of course, the classic Jack Kirby space gods mythology, based on the 1970s Eric Von Donneken ancient astronaut Rage. Here we see Arashem, leader of the space gods. He is the judge, cosmic judge of humanity. And he has his big thumb here, and on his thumb is a formula that will spell potential destruction or higher evolution for the planet. And he stands when they arrive here. The space gods arrive mysteriously at the Inca temples, of course. The fourth host. When they say hosts, I'll explain that shortly. But anyway, this guy here, the leader of the space gods, Arashem will stand on these pillars in these ancient temples in the mountains, the Andes. And what's going on here is the so-called 50-year judgment. Here it is. Dun, dun, dun. Jack Kirby says, Arashem, the mightiest of the fourth host, having enforced his will, raises his mammoth arm toward the sky. It singles, signals the beginning of the 50-year judgment the final stage of an experiment carried out by the Celestials among the countless stars on countless worlds like Earth. In the fond hope of generating what the Celestials term as Alpha Day. There it is, Alpha Day. But 
Endless time has produced endless failure. Thus, Arashem stands ready to do what he has always done. He is a planet killer. Engraved on his thumb is the formula for world destruction. If Earth fails, Earth dies. And that is very dramatic, but I believe it is necessary because it makes it very clear what's going on here. Because the apocalyptic time that we're in now is when the space god's mythology must be revealed, defined, and put behind us as an understanding. And when I say understanding, I mean something that is understood. We are standing at a certain level, and certain things are under us, and we must have a grasp of them. We can't be fucking around with a bunch of different conflicting arguments and personality cults. We have to be unified like the Eternals here. See, look at this. This is another aspect to the Space Gods mythology that has to be considered. In the Kirby mythos, the Space Gods create modern humans, but they also create... Uh, kind of chaos and order beings. The chaos beings are the deviants who live underground, and they eventually create the Lemurian Empire. They're kind of like shapeshifters, quasi Ike reptilian type characters, very evil and lecherous. And then they have the perfect, beautiful people who are the uh, Eternals who live in their Mount Olympus like compound high in the uh, Greek islands. And what they do is they have an ability to join together into what's called the Unimind. Because the Eternals, being created directly by the Space Gods, perfect and aware and having all the knowledge and power that is the destiny, they're immortal, they have all these wonderful happy powers, they consider themselves as close to gods as possible, and they were in fact worshipped as gods by the primitive humans. And they are the caretakers of the Earth, in their opinion. And so in order to confront the Space Gods when the 50-year judgment is going to occur, the, inhum the, the, the uh, Eternals have to have some kind of inhuman or beyond-human level of confronting them. And what they do is they combine, they all fly together and they combine into this marvelous thing called the Unimind. And what the Unimind is, it's a four-dimensional mini-brain representing all of the Eternals as one. And this actually was my own first idea of like a planetary brain concept because if we take the idea the earth is alive and the space gods are like a father inseminating the mother creating the children who are the humans deviants and eternals then the eternals represent the higher brain cells of the children all the children are the brain and the human the, the eternals represent the highest level and so this idea of a higher brain the unimind which can then float up and confront the uh, Celestials directly is a key concept to help me to understand what I now have come to term my view of the elite, the informed, those in the know, as opposed to those not in the know. You know, the relevant players of the cosmic game as opposed to the people who are helplessly at the mercy of the game. Sounds rather elitist, but you know, that's just the way it is. So I just have to quickly here uh, correct myself. Uh, not correct myself, but expand further then. I just want to go I'll just with the full details on the Kirby mythos of the space gods because it's the most coherent picture and influenced me so dramatically in my youth and has defined my whole paradigm to the present, okay? So Kirby comes up with this, po posits this hypothesis of essentially the 26,000 year cycle where he's trying to mythologize all of the different histories that have been floating around since Theosophy kicked it all to the surface. You know, this is the 1970s, it's kind of hip to reconsider. Von Donneken has made things kind of okay to be talked about with his whole alien gods uh, returning. So Kirby posits four hosts that this alien gods will be visiting us in, okay? All right? The Celestials visit a planet in fourth hosts. The first come to, came down to Earth before there were men upon it. But they did find our common ancestor who became subject to their experiments. That's the creation of the three races, okay? And so that create, it creates these races, and the, Lemur, the Lemurian Empire of the Deviants goes to war with the Eternals, who create like an Atlantis superculture. And the Celestials return with the second host, and they're not very happy with the course that things have taken. Wrath and discipline mark the coming of the second host. 
Many civilizations spawned in the past, in the dim past vanished, forcing man to climb again in new directions. So the first level of uh, experiment was a failure, and paradise was lost, essentially. And that's pretty much how Atlantis comes into the picture. That's what I, I have good reason to suspect to be the case. There's tons of evidence. If you look at everything from the Graham Hancock evidence, this type of planetary game board stuff here, zooming in on Temple of Kukulkan and Stonehenge, just as an example, right? Crop circles as well. Uh, the idea of the planet as a brain, the monuments create a b game board that reflects many things. One, things. one thing it reflects is a higher level intelligence organizing human culture. And again, we can go back to the Dogons. They have evidence their culture has been influenced based on the revolutions of the star Sirius and its dark neighbor, which nobody can see, yet they know everything about. Okay, so this higher level information is left behind and it posits the contact scenario that uh, eventually leads to things like Atlantis as the idea that, okay, we have the game board all over the planet, so that posits a planetary civilization. So that equals, since it's human, obviously, yet terribly advanced, that all of our cultures and civilizations now are merely leftovers and former colonies of a super civilization, which was destroyed either by its own war or, in Kirby's view, by the space gods bitch slapping them for having fallen into ego and failing to serve the needs that they were created for. So then, humanity climbs back up, and of course I'll go into this whole timeline of events, the big cosmic timeline. The reason that's good for you to use the Kirby mythos now is because he does go over the whole timeline mythologically. Here's a good example of the Zodiac cycle and my secret Masonic stuff, okay? The cosmic timeline, space gods create humanity at the top, which is Aquarius. Things go into the Scorpio phase here, which is when Atlantis and Lemuria are created. So you have the period from Atlantis, I mean from uh, Genesis of uh, 26,000 years ago, when the space gods arrive and do their creation scheme, do whatever they're doing, until this point here, which is uh, 19,500 years ago, which is the age of Scorpio, which is when the mysterious civilizations of humanity were first created, Atlantis and Lemuria are examples of that. And the timeline goes along until you come to the age of Leo, 10,500 B.C., which is when this occurs, the bitch slapping. And, of course, Hancock, again, I'll just zoom in on the Temple of Kukan and Stonehenge to echo Hancock, uh, makes it pretty clear in his evidence that 10,500 B.C. is the cataclysmic date for the Great Flood. And any other date may or may not be a residual aftershock. Some people like to go as late as 8,500, but I don't, I don't agree. I think 10,500 is the mark, and we have plenty to support that as found in Hancock's evidence, Heaven's Mirror, Fingerprints of the Gods, etc. Continuing then, humanity has to build itself back up, and we have like the Conan the Barbarian period of post-Atlantis confrontations with cosmic forces hanging around. This is also the Tolkien Third Age when the events Lord of the Rings type events would be happening. And what you see here is interesting. The Age of Leo is where the Atlantis and Lemuria are destroyed. Everything goes to hell. Great Flood, etc. You go moving along, you get to the Age of Cancer. Okay? And what's interesting here is that if you have the Atlantean artifacts that would be left after the chaos of the Flood, everything would... You take the Age... If, all right, if the Cataclysm occurs here at Leo, okay then it's going to take about 2,000 years for anything to get semi-ordered again. So this whole zodiac period from the date of the Flood, around 10,500 B.C., into the beginning of the Age of Cancer is the picking up the pieces. Who knows who's left? We know a few people are left. We know the Atlanteans are left. Some of them have survived. And I believe they went to Venus and Mars, possibly the Moon, because we have to posit that Atlantis was a spacefaring civilization to an interplanetary uh, solar system level, not galactic, but solar system level. So, because we have to remember in the 1950s, a lot of the UFO contacts that were happening were from people who looked pretty much like you and I that came in these ships, claimed to be from Venus, but they didn't say they lived in, on the surface. They said they were from there. Why? I believe that Atlantis had high technology outposts on both Venus and Mars, obviously and that uh, the Mars outpost has an underground facility 
which is later dug up and used by, wait for it, the characters who in my mythos will become the space gods. Dun, dun, dun. Anyway, my point about the Age of Cancer, which appear, appears after Leo, is that the Masonic Royal Arch, which we have plenty, action, plenty of action on here, for example, has the Age of Cancer as the keystone. And the, the idea is that here we are, here we are. The idea is that uh, the keystone arch is for marking where the Temple of Solomon's treasures are buried in the crypt. Okay, the keystone is the thing you pull out and oh, I discovered the secret vault, etc. Now, what's in the secret vault? It's the answers to all of the riddles of ancient history in m most New Age cults, such as Solar Temple, etc. The contents of the vault discovered by the Templars later passed on to them, supposedly. Those contents are relating to the secret mysteries of Atlantis, which were lost during this, and have been left behind for us to find now, around the year 1000. And curiously about that is, Templars opening this tomb in the year 1000, Kirby has the third host of Celestials arriving at that time, but not in Europe or in the Holy Land. They arrive in the Inca New World area. And there they set up their base, and inspection and cultivation was the job of the third host. The Inca civilization had received them as gods. The Celestials roamed the world on strange vehicles and caused consternation among the superstitious. Okay? Etc. So, what happens is, is that the uh, Celestials then return with the fourth host. We saw some of this in my previous dialogues, leading up to the 50-year judgment, which is Kirby's view on the Apocalypse. Now, for me, this works perfectly as a mythological cycle because it does incorporate things like the Hancock evidence in a science fiction context which is very satisfying and mythologically resonant with our needs currently. And it has lots of implications. Peter the Great, of course, is tied up. Why? Because it's a good bet that a lot of the Templar artifacts he ended up with. Why? Because secret expeditions sent to Jerusalem based on information he gathered through his knowledge of what the Emperor Julian was up to. Can't get into that right now. But uh... Oh, by the way, a side note, just to record, telepathy is a inevitable consequence of the Gaia hypothesis. Why? Because telepathy or communication between brain cells must occur because of the unimind effect, right? Humans are all part of the same brain. Therefore, we all have contact unconsciously anyway through the collective consciousness as we understand it. And, uh, you know, I may be getting sidetracked with the Space Gods dialogue, but maybe not. You know, it could all be connected. So anyway, my view on the Space Gods then is that they are conspirators, human conspirators, who 26,000 years from now have discovered the secret Atlantean horde on Mars. Okay? Contained in, here's a, wait for it, contained in the Atlantean records stored on Mars is the story of how the space gods came and created humanity 26,000 years in our past. So, 52,000 years in the past from where these characters are reading it as they discover the artifacts, okay? Now, the Atlantean horde tells about the arrival of the space gods, the creation of Atlantis itself, etc., all that. The Atlanteans left it on Mars for us to find in the future. But it also contains analysis, blueprints, and data on what the space gods are. So, what do these Illuminati conspirators do? They decide, okay, we're going to become the space gods. And also contained in the Atlantis information is mystical formulas for contacting the Sirius intelligence, which has been a helping hand to Earth in one form or another. And the serious contact is a deal made between these Illuminati conspirators far in the future and serious aliens who are four-dimensional, five-dimensional, and therefore don't really think of time the same way we do. So we can't say they're in the future. I think that for these characters in our future, 26,000 years from now, who'd be contacting these Syrians, that the serious beings they're going to contact would be exactly the same as the serious beings I could contact today. 
or that have been contacted 10,000 years ago. In other words, all of our linear time doors open onto the same four-dimensional plane where these serious aliens exist. That's why they're always seen as the blazing star, which is always permanent in the sky no matter what year, time, or, and that's why the Egyptian calendar was based on the revolutions of that star. On and on and on, blah, 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 but the space gods cut a deal with these Syrians to learn how to put into effect the plans that they discovered of the Atlantean horde, and they become the space gods, and they then are going to travel back in time, 26,000 years to our point, pass by us briefly, get the handoff of the program, as we've talked about before, and then go 26,000 years into the past, and they're going to arrive at the specific genesis point that they're arriving at because they read about it in the Atlantean Archive. But the reason it's in the Atlantean Archive is because they put it there when they arrived. So, what we see here is the classic paradox loop that time travel presents. But it's not even a problem. It's not a paradox. You know why? Because it's sideways movement of the planetary brain. Think of the planetary brain like this unimind. Okay, floating in the soup. Five-dimensional soup. And one particular version of our zodiac history is like a cross-section view of this brain. Okay? If you took this brain and did a CAT scan of it, you'd see this. You'd see the zodiac cycle with the 49, the 12, 49 squared Abraxas magic squares all held together by the Mandela action, etc. Again, forget the Masonic coding content on this evolution, all these different things you see here. Just focus on the structure and the geometry. Now, that cross-sectioning of the brain contains one particular arrangement of the contents that describes its location in the infinitude of hyperspace. That location, the description of that location is the one singular linear history for this entire loop. So, if the brain moves, let's say, 5,000 meters to the left, the information describing, not to the left as in moving down my street, to the left as in moving through hyperspace. If it moves through hyperspace, then its movement will change the actual history of the inhabitants of the planet. So from our point of view, history will change if the Unimind moves one way or the other. Why is this important? Because the movements of the Unimind are dictated by the brain cells effectively unifying to work according to a plan provided providentially by the ISIS intelligence. And things like the gnomes and the uh, gods, the gods are part of the program. We can look at the program written by the space gods as downloading a specific version of history that will be enacted by humans as they're manipulated by the god forms and we can see how history itself is a manipulation of God concepts. This is a super Illuminati conspiracy. However, the non-linear nature of it makes it very suspect in terms of what we can do now. Because if it's a non-linear spinning disk, getting back to the Unimind moving, it moves and as a result the history changes. So we want to move it ourselves in specific directions and we can do that by inserting programs into the Mandela, a version of history that we design can actually cause the Unimind to move if we effectively convey the plot level such that people believe it. Dun, dun, dun. So the space gods don't care. Once they become these Illuminati conspirators in the future, once they become the gigantic space gods, and we can see here, one good part of our uh, mystery book is the Temple Secrets coming right after our Joseph Smith hypocephalus facsimiles, etc., etc., right? See these? These are like, again, programs that will be inserted similar to this. You can look at a globe. Let's say the horizontal axis of the globe is this 12-fold zodiac cycle. The vertical axis would be the Joseph Smith-style hypocephalus with your own personal cosmic plot written in. Okay, and a vertical and horizontal disk define a sphere, which would be, again, the planetary brain. So, if a cross-section horizontally of the brain is a zodiac plot describing a 26,000-year history model, then a vertical section of the brain is a hypocephalus of the Joseph Smith style. 
Here's a classical Egyptian hypocephalus, just for comparison. And all this comes together, this brain, the unimind seen here is Kirby's view of Eternals, parts of the human planetary brain coming together. But the brain I'm talking about, really, each space god, if you could open up the helmet of this space god, you would see a brain similar to the unimind, and that brain is composed of lifetimes of the individual who composes that space god. And this gets into my whole plot level of me and uh, Barbara possibly being a space god, etc. Can't get into that right now. We only have three minutes left. But the point is, here we see temple secrets and the idea that the Temple of Solomon is actually a plan for a mega man, mega man, a giant man, let's say. And the temple and the man are the same thing. This is the essential key to Freemasonry's idea of geometry of the hyperspatial self, concepts that apply in many different ways that can't even be talked about right now. Okay? And uh, what I'm talking about, though, generally for the space god concept, Freemasonically speaking, as it relates to these things, is that it's a matrix of symbolism. A space god is composed of a matrix of symbolic factors that are controlled through a program that will be handed to them by us now. Well, not now, seven years from now. And so what I'm doing in my next dialogue then is fully defining who the space guards are, what they want, what their agenda is, and how it's all dictated by this, the 26,000 year plan. And the integration of that with some of our other material on them will provide for some hearty viewing indeed. We just got to keep thinking about this thumb, okay? That's what I'm going to leave you with in this diagram. Uh, this di diagram. This monologue. It's not a dialogue, it's a monologue. The thumb of Arishim. Okay? Study it. Because it represents a failure of purple. In other words, it's a red-blue conflict. It's the game, apocalypse, apocalypse game played to a deadly conclusion instead of a happy resolution. And the deadly conclusion would be if we fail to produce the Alpha. Remember, all the space gods care about are the day, is the day of Alpha. If we can give it to them... They will give us all of the eternal powers that are our birthright as four-dimensional beings. What those powers are, what the Day of Alpha is, how it plays into this overall cycle, and other exciting questions we will tackle in our next Titanic Dialogue. For now, I'm zooming in over to here as the final minute clicks off. Come over across the gnomes, the homuncular house. The hands, the cosmic puppeteers. Yes. Back up to here. The clock. The program. All hail Abraxas.